Spotlight. I'm Christy Wozniak. Today, we're talking about a recent big win for producers. As you know, John Deere has recently agreed to allow farmers to service their own equipment. So joining me today is a man who has great insight and some advice to producers who are uh, tackling fixing their own John Deere equipment. Uh, and not just John Deere equipment, uh, a lot of other types of equipment as well. His company, ERD, has 20 plus years of experience in refurbishing legacy and new electronics. From Kernsville, North Carolina, I'd like to welcome president of ERD, Glenn Flaherty. Welcome, Glenn, and thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Oh, no problem, Chrissy. It'd be nice to talk to you and all your uh, listeners out there. Yeah. So first of all, do you want to just give me a bit about your, your own personal background? Well, I'm uh, originally from New England. So I went to college in Worcester, Massachusetts. And when I got out of college, it was a, unfortunately a recession. And the uh, jobs were more in North Carolina than they were in New England. So I relocated to New England about 32 years now. And I've lived here in North Carolina ever since. And I've always been an engineer by trade. And for the last 27 years, I've owned ERD. Very good. And so tell, tell us about ERD then. So ERD is an engineering company in the sense that we look at anything that's electronic, we think we can figure it out and fix it. So we're not dedicated to just one industry, we're actually in a broad range of industries. And we look at ourselves as being kind of an, a craft of trying to repair electronics. Uh, it's a challenge, we're a problem solver and people bring to us from many different walks of life and many different industries equipment that is seriously hampering their way of life. So whether it's manufacturing and textiles and automaking to farms and using equipment on the farm, like right here, we have a John Deere baler that we're going to be repairing for a farm out in the Midwest. And right now they kind of need their baler. <laughs> yep. They will soon. <laughs> Definitely. Yep. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So, uh, and you also, I learned, have a very diverse background. You have a degree in both electrical engineering and philosophy. So why and how have those worked together in your life, uh, in your life and your business over the years? Well, I think part of, you know, I, I, you know, people would say you use your engineering degree more. And, you know, most people would say the stereotype of an engineer is not somebody who would be doing a podcast or somebody who would be you know, running a company. Usually engineers are a little more in the background for the most part. So I, I'm gonna give my uh, philosophy degree the uh, credit to that. And I guess what I'm about is being diverse. I guess I don't wanna be pigeonholed for one thing. And that's why I have two separate degrees and in such completely different areas. Mm -hmm. And I like to think my passion comes from the philosophy aspect. So for me, when we work on something, a lot of times we're doing it not, not necessarily because of the money we can make from it, but because it's important to someone. So there's many times that we'll bring in work that, you know, we realize we're not going to make any money off of it, but it helps somebody. So that's, I think, comes from my philosophy side where, you know, try to make a difference to people. Yeah, that makes sense. So what is the ERD powertrain? How does it support the agriculture industry? Okay, so ERD is, is really two parts now. So ERD powertrain is our division that's working on harnesses and materials that we need to make for vehicles or farm equipment. So right now we have product lines that we actually manufacture to support what people can't buy without a six month or a one year lead time. Wow, uh, that's Also, yeah, so we're trying to cut down the time and issues that people are not able to use their equipment with that. Now, if it's an existing product that we can repair, the ERD side will work on it. So like this Baylor unit right here is a piece of equipment that John Deere considers unsupportable. And to them, I believe for this Baylor, you have to replace 
basically everything. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure the the expense on that, you'd probably be better off buying a new bailiff. And I'm sure that's part of what they would like you to do. Yeah. Whereas this unit came in this week and it'll be shipped back to the customer probably within two weeks. Wow. Wow. In working order, I assume. <laughs> in working order. And the yeah. one thing that make, makes us different is anything that we can video when we're running a piece of equipment, we'll create a test video and send it to our customers so they can see their equipment in use right. and wow. working before we ship it typically or right after. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that I'm sure gives we, them a little comfort too. Well, and, and, and we do that because we try to refurbish everything, not repair it. So yeah. we're not going to do like the minimum amount of work. We're going to do what work that can sustain our three-year warranty because right. that's what we give on all our repairs. Yeah. So we obviously want to do a job that makes it last longer than that. We don't want it to come back. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, so uh, kind of the, the main issue I want to talk about today is uh, how the American Farm Bureau announced recently that it had reached a memorandum of understanding with John Deere stating mm -hmm. that it would provide farmers and independent repair shops the information uh, that they would need to service the company's equipment. So can you explain this from your point of view? Okay, so the biggest problem that from our dealing with John Deere, that out in the field, there's two specific problems that farmers have had with John Deere. First off is the availability of replacement parts, which of course means downtime for whatever equipment it is, whether it's a, a baler or a thresher or any of the real high-end stuff, uh, they don't have the parts. So now they're allowing people like ERD to have the technical documentation to be able to help with the repair. Additionally, I believe they're allowing the authorization of other people to enable new equipment in the field. So I know from personal experience with a farmer out in Kansas that when you buy a piece of equipment for one of the highly automated systems, it requires a service tech to fly in from John Deere wow. to hook up a laptop and press two or three buttons and there you go. They're coming up with a way so that people like myself or dealers can do that and the farmer doesn't have this unexpected large expense after they buy the new piece of equipment for their equipment. Yeah. So that's an exciting change that I think is going to uh, help world, worldwide and in the US farmers who are just have a lot of equipment that's sitting idle but waiting for either a tech or a piece of equipment to be repaired or a new piece that you know has to be activated right yeah yeah and and you know just playing devil's advocate a little bit uh it it makes sense for a company to want to keep these things under lock and key you know ensuring they get like you said that long-term business parts and repair and flying people around um, so where do you think the line is? Like, what's, what is really fair for everyone in this situation? Well, I think that you have to look at the computer world as an example. Okay. So the PC as we're using right now, I don't know if you're using an Apple, but I'm using a PC is something that is distributed among a lot of companies. There's a lot of people that know how to work on it and it's not proprietary. Then you have Apple. Well, Apple has a nice product, but it's a much smaller market share because if you have to have stuff worked on and you're not willing to wait or pay the premium, you're not going to buy an Apple because mm -hmm. you're locked into their network. So I think the fairness thing is, is John Deere is looking now more into the future to be more like a, okay, the Chevy model or the Ford model or the, you know, let independent people work on their equipment because it it makes people less, more likely to buy new equipment when they need new equipment and right. less problems for the OEM, you know, in terms of complaints or, you know, there's been legal action over the years. And I think there's got to be a middle ground. We're not here to copy John Deere's stuff and make our own thresher. 
We just want the ability to help the farmer out in the field keep doing their job. And, you know, John Deere can't be everywhere at any point, in, every point in time. It's just not feasible for them. Yeah, yeah, those are really good points. And so, uh, as you've explained, you've successfully repaired hundreds of John Deere units. Um, the machines are really complex and not all producers will know where to start when trying to fix things themselves now. I think a lot of them are mm -hmm. excited they can, but just really don't know mm -hmm. where to start. So that's where your company can help. So, so how would they use your services? What's the process? Well, our process is simple. The way we really work best is, and we've learned this through international work and working with cruise ships on the ocean, is if somebody has a problem, reach out to us. Usually it's either me or one of the technical people, if they don't know where to start, we'll give them some brief guidance, like, okay, what's going on? You know, we're problem solvers. So a good portion of the time, if they call us at the beginning, we can walk them through and go, you know, we don't absolutely know that this is the problem, but this is what you need to check and start there. We've done video conferencing with customers. We've sent pictures, they've sent pictures. And usually we can work enough so that we can find where the problem probably is. And sometimes we can fix it and we're like, okay, that's a mechanical problem. You need to go this direction. And, you know, it's not us. And we're fine with that because really what we believe is in the long-term model of being somebody known as a problem solver. And maybe today we're not the answer you need, but we might be able to tell you where to go. Yeah. Because we know down the road, when you do have a problem that you do need us, you're going to call us. So we're looking at it from the long-term standpoint. Yeah, I love that. And so you you work with people across the U.S., but do you also work with people in Canada? Oh, absolutely. We we nice. we've worked with every province. Uh, you know, even the one with the name that I can't pronounce, the one way up there, <laughs> the middle of nowhere, <laughs> uh, the northern northern north part of Canada. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Maritime. You know, British Columbia, oh Saskatchewan. I can pronounce that one. Uh, yeah. We've done. We've done trucks for people up there, uh, Ford units out of boom lifts and scissor lifts and wow. uh, definitely construction equipment. A lot of that yeah. uh, uh, broad range of you know, Caterpillar, Volvo, all the basic brands. And actually we did one, we did a Komatsu for a guy that had to wait three months. I believe it was Canada because it was during the winter and he had to wait three months to actually get to where it was because it was in the frozen part of his area, <laughs> which oh, is, wow. you know, some unique, some unique things uh, like yeah. that. Up in the snow roads areas. <laughs> yeah. Like way up where you can't get there for a few months. So yeah. yes, we do. We do Canada. And of course we do Mexico and we've done work for all the continents, except uh, I don't think we've done Antarctica. Would be nice to do Antarctica and knock that. Yeah, out, you should check that Antarctica. box. <laughs> That's right. We've done all the other ones, and uh, we've had a lot of success. And using our technology, we can work through language barriers, oh. and you know, using video, which we do a lot of, we can use that tool to help people, especially with cell phones. There's no reason why you know it can't be done better. Yeah. Have you ever thought of putting on webinars for farmers that are you know, that want to learn, learn some of the basics? Actually, we're in the process of doing an educational channel. We're in the process oh, of planning amazing. that out. And uh, it'll be, we, right now we have three YouTube channels. We have our primary YouTube channel, which is, uh, shows different equipment. We work with playlists by industry. We have a, a dedicated video channel that's just road testing when we fix tractor trailer trucks we put the modules we own a truck so we put it in the truck and drive it around the neighborhood wow so that's all it's on that video so <laughs> that's a, it's not very exciting but you know your module works and then the third one is anything that we video we use that channel to immediately send to the customer after it's done hey look your unit's doing something and we're shipping it back to you wow so we have three levels of channels now but the educational is the one we're planning right now. Right. Oh, that's good. So what's your YouTube channel? So we can share the links in the show notes. Okay. Right now, if you go to YouTube, you can go to ERD LTD INC, otherwise known as the industrial repair store, and it'll pop okay. up. 
We pop up all over the place. And then we have the ERD road test and we have ERD video test. So all those channels, we'll put links available for the people yep. to see all these videos. Uh, we have some that are longer than others. And as I said, the educational channel, we probably will create as a playlist on our main video channel. Yeah. So just click on playlist and you'll see all the different sorted by categories. And of course that's there great. is farm equipment as a category. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So um, what is your website then? Where can people reach you? Okay. So go to www.industrialrepairstore.com. Perfect. Awesome. And do you have any advice, advice to farmers on um, tackling these issues? Well, the advice I would give to them is upfront when you go to buy new equipment, as part of the deal, if you're buying anything from a new, from an, as new equipment, make them include all the service manuals that exist, make them include any software that allows you to change parameters, because then when you're buying something new is when you have the most ability to get it from an OEM not after the fact. Right. So build that in. Say, hey, I want all the service manuals. Because no matter what, it's a tool that is you know, being beat on out in the world. And it's going to fail no matter what. So get the tools up front that you can when you go to buy that new equipment. And the same goes for surplus equipment. Know what you're looking at. Ask people's advice. We, we, we have spent many years helping people determine whether they should buy a piece of equipment or not by giving them things to look for. Yeah. You know, maybe it is completely worn out and that's why it's too good to be true. So those are the kind of things, no, you know, try to educate yourself a little bit before you sign on the dotted line. Yeah, that's excellent advice. Very good. And I have one last question for you. So why do you serve in this way? Um, I can tell you're very helpful. You want to serve. Um, what's your greatest passion in all of it? Well, I guess my passion is I like, I get this from my mother. I, I, I'm a helper. <laughs> okay. I was raised that way by my parents and specifically my mother is a, a helper. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always a glass half full and I always want to be out there to help. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you shouldn't. But I always look forward and I'm going to do it anyways. So, you know, it's, it's just built into me to, to do something to help people when there's a problem. So I guess it's perfect that my company is a problem solving company then. Yeah, for sure. And it seems like it served you well. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Glenn, for joining me today. There's that's some really good information for farmers all across North America. Okay. Well, thank you for the interview. Yeah. And thanks to all who are watching or listening. If you want to learn more, the links are provided in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to North American Egg Spotlight on YouTube, Rumble, Telegram, or Egg Fuse channels. And the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts and have a great day. 